One of the biggest challenges in reefing is how many elements of filtration there are in our reef tanks, but how little information there is and how to use them effectively. Done right, you can actually feed nearly as much as you want with very little concern about elevated nutrients or related pollutants. Over the years, it's become pretty apparent to me that reef filtration is best looked at in three stages, starting with stage number one, meaning I wanna remove the waste or uneaten food, those whole pellets or whole shrimp, or actually some of the resulting waste that comes from the fish as well, I wanna remove that as there's still a solid. And the best way to do that is actually turns out to be one of the simplest and cheapest ways to do it is just the filter socks and pads that are on our tank. So with those filter socks, if you change them out often enough, you can actually remove up to 40% of the phosphate and nutrients from the tank. Now I say 40% less because that's actually the result of a set of experiments we did a while back where we changed up the frequency of when we took out the filter socks. In this case, we found that it was actually about twice a week or every three days or so produced 40% organics or resulting phosphate into the tank. Now 40% is a pretty big number and it might change a little bit on your system design, but 40% is also a lot. And if you think about it, it may actually mean you can do 40% less water changes and then for yourself you can decide What's harder? Am I changing out a few filter socks a couple times a week, or am I doing more water changes? Which one of these is easier? But you can start to realize how big a deal these little filter socks are that capture the food before it ever has a chance to break down can really be removing half of the total waste. The obvious evolution of that has been the roller mats or felt rolls that are built into many sumps. In this case, it's actually rolling it out almost in real time, meaning a lot of that waste is actually only in the tank for a matter of hours rather than days, and almost certainly much more effective. However, both of these things are adjustable. And in terms of filter socks, if I want to allow more nitrogen and phosphor in this tank because I'm running into what I see as zero, zero, I can just change out these filter socks less. I can actually change them out more often as well. And many of the felt rolls can actually adjust how long you're going to leave the felt in the tank as well, giving you that ability to use the filtration more intelligently and allow control over how much nitrogen, phosphorus, or nutrients are in your tank. Now the second stage of this is food that's settled out in the tank somewhere is going to break down into smaller particles. In this case, it's often the skimmer that is gonna pull these out. These dissolved organic compounds contain nitrogen and phosphorus and the skimmer will just strip them out. I've seen claims that they're as effective as 80% or as little as 30%, and it really probably depends on the quality of the skimmer and how you implement it, how you tuned it, and matching the right skimmer to the size of your tank. But in any case, you can probably remove as much as half of the waste this way as well. How well this works for you or what range you find yourself in is often closely tied to how well you understand that this is a foam engine. Meaning the skimmer is an engine that combines air and organics as a fuel to create foam and then the cup collects it. If you have too little air, the skimmer will actually work but only will remove a small amount of fraction. Meaning if you undersize the skimmer or the undersize the amount of air that you needed, it may actually only produce 30% or even lower. However, the inverse of too much air or oversizing the skimmer is maybe actually worse. In this case, there's not enough organics for the amount of air being put in there and the bubbles just pop. Most often this just looks like a skimmer that clearly has foam top to bottom, but the top it just looks like boiling water and nothing is coming out the top. And that's because there's just not enough organics to be able to hold a stable foam head for the volume of air that's coming out of the skimmer. So in this case, I think it's better to have a too small skimmer than too big, but obviously the right answer is to get the right solution for you. Now, one of the things that's really been a problem here is the right solution kind of changes. When I start the tank, I may only have three fish. By the time that the tank is full, I might have 30 fish. And I don't want to buy skimmers along the way. And that's why DC skimmers have become so popular. With a DC skimmer, I can actually adjust the amount of air to fit the amount of organics that are in the tank. Adjusting the amount of air that's going in the skimmer to match the amount of organics in there is probably the best influence that you have on creating wet skimmate, dry skimmate, or no skimmate at all. And best yet, if you have the ability to do that, again, it can meet all kinds of different needs or the entire journey of your tank rather than just one point. Outside of DC pumps and the ability to control the speed of the pump, the amount of air it injects into the skimmer, 
one of the best ways to influence how much air is in there is actually to make sure that the skimmer is installed in the right depth. I mean, the manufacturer has told you that it is best uh, installed at seven inches or 10 inches. And we've actually tested and found that most of them are very, very accurate at that depth as where they perform the best. So make sure to read the instructions. And if it says seven inches, do your best to actually get that level of water in your sump because you might be surprised how much it helps with performance. There's also a third stage here. The food must have got past our filter socks or felt, it also got past the skimmer, and now it's just broken down into nitrate and phosphate, and we can test for it in the tank. So in this case, we wanna remove that as well, especially if it's consistently rising. And the best ways to do that, I've found, are actually refugiums, algae scrubbers, and algae reactors. Refugium's often the end game solution, meaning in most cases you can get a refugium set up to strip out most of the nitrate or phosphate. In fact, in many cases it might actually work too well. So using a high powered light, it's really easy to actually get algae like this to just soak up all the excess nitrogen and phosphorus. In fact, sometimes it may actually prefer ammonia, meaning you're capturing it before it breaks down into nitrate in some cases. So refugium's that end game solution, they're also adjustable meaning that uh, I don't necessarily need to have them on for 12 hours a day. If I'm finding I got zero, zero uh, nitrate and phosphate, I can shrink it down to eight hours, I can shrink it down to two hours, I could actually do alternating days. I don't even have to have it on but two days a week. I can adjust the light, I can turn down the intensity of the light and the rate of photosynthesis and uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus to meet those needs, probably the most tunable end game solution for nitrate and phosphate. LG Reactor, almost the exact same thing. It's like a refugium in a can. The can meaning I can actually put it in a vertical space in my uh, sump area or even inside the sump and save a lot of space. It's also a lot cleaner, tends to have less odor in it. So just a cleaner way to implement a refugium in your tank, but producing almost the same results. Working on a similar principle to that is the algae scrubber, but it's also a much smaller form factor and works a little bit different. In this case, you have a screen in there that will grow uh, hair algae on it and you'll just harvest it. And part of the benefit here is the hair algae is actually a simpler form of algae and it just grows a lot faster and uptakes nitrogen and phosphorus faster. So you can get similar performance as a much larger refugium in a tiny little form factor. So a little bit more maintenance, harvesting and maintaining it, but you save a lot of space. You can see the three-prong approach here. Capture the waste as it's whole. Capture when it's broken down into proteins or dissolved organics, and then also capture what we've missed. And these probably the best solutions for me. However, even though I don't use this method very often myself, I don't want to overlook carbon dosing and bacteria, which is also kind of a stage three where you're going to strip out the nitrogen and phosphorus or nitrate and phosphate from the tank once it's already broken down. Now this method isn't as well understood, but basically you're gonna dose organic carbon to the tank, which will promote uh, an explosion of the bacteria in the tank that will strip out the nitrate and phosphate as they grow that population. It's also notable that carbon dosing is one of those things that can actually work too well as well, meaning that you're gonna end up getting closer to that zero, zero or zero nitrate and phosphate in the tank, which is unhealthy for the corals. So the best systems actually acknowledge that to be the case and then address it with the heavy in, heavy out, meaning Red Sea's NO3 PO4X also has the nutrition additives, meaning you're dosing the carbohydrates as well as amino acids into the tank to address for the fact that we have a total approach to nutrition. Again, the best carbon dosing uh, additive systems actually addressing that up front rather than letting you find it out later. And KZ Zeovit probably being the most time tested approach to carbon dosing, and from the very beginning, ultra low nutrients or nitrate and phosphate combined with ultra high nutrition via many of the additives that they put in the tank, as well as using the Zeovit rocks to produce bacterial mulm that will also feed the corals. So in this case, consistently long-term results achieved with Zeovit and probably the most robust time-tested carbon dosing method. It's also helpful to know there's other tools out there that will help all of these filtration methods work better. For instance, flow will help almost all of them work better by keeping all of the waste suspended in the water for as long as possible. And flow in a bare bottom will actually keep it out of the sand as well and suspended where the filtration can get it. And if these things aren't working all together in like things like phosphate or just perpetually rising, there are bigger hammer type solutions like GFO or lanthium chloride or phosphate E that you can use intelligently as needed. 
All this filtration based on replacing an older approach of reliance on water changes and physically swapping out old water with new. So what is water changes role in nutrient and pollution control in today's modern tanks? That's next. <laughs> 